All right. Well, welcome to our two participants with um, on tonight's webinar. We uh, thank you for listening in and, and tuning in tonight. We know that it's a busy time of the year, right before Christmas, and this is our last webinar of of the fall season. So thanks for being with us tonight, and hopefully we can have a really in depth and robust discussion, a question and answer period after the webinar with with the couple of participants that are here. So. I want to introduce our farmer tonight with our presenters. So we'll be speaking on direct marketing grain finished beef. And we have Shannon and Bo Ebersol uh, from Ebersol Cattle Company here and they're veterans in the uh, cattle industry. So they'll be sharing their expertise um, on raising grain finished beef. And we have Dave Hill here, who's a beginning farmer and very interested in getting into the grain finished beef business. So he's here to stimulate discussion with the other souls and ask him all kinds of questions. So once again, thanks for tuning in to our last farmer of the fall series. We will be starting up a winter, a winter farmer series on Tuesday nights at seven o'clock again on January 13th. And we'll be releasing that schedule very soon, so keep your eyes out for that. And a quick note about PFI. So Practical Farmers, I'm sure you're familiar with, but it was founded in 1985, and we're a farmer-led, member-driven nonprofit, and we facilitate farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange of knowledge. So that's really why we're here tonight, to hear this discussion between farmers and to learn from each other. And our mission is to strengthen farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. Uh, we, we value creativity, collaboration, and community. We want viable farms for now and, the, and future generations, and we value stewardship and ecology. And we are, like I said, we are member-driven and we are 2,500 members strong currently, and we encourage everyone to join our organization. And you can find lots more details on that uh, on our website, practicalfarmers.org. And we're always constantly updating our calendar and events page. So always be sure to log on and check out our upcoming events and our partner organization's events. And just to bring to your attention, if you don't know already, our big event for the year is coming up in January. It's the 23rd and 24th at the Sheeman Center in Ames. We are holding our annual conference titled Mapping Our Future, and we're expecting over 900. So it's going to be a really great event. And just a couple quick rules here for the Farminar. Um, we ask that you type your questions into the chat box on the left-hand side, and we'll reserve the final 30 minutes for a question and answer session. And um, we always record and archive our farmers so they're able to access in the future, which I'm sure will have many people accessing this in the future because, um, because they may not have been able to tune in because of the holidays. So, all right, I am going to let Dave Hill introduce himself now. Um, he is a beginning farmer here who is going to be stimulating this discussion with the Eversoles about uh, finishing, producing and finishing grain, grain finished beef. So Dave, if you want to say a couple quick words and then we'll turn it over to the Eversoles. All right, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Dave Hill. Uh, I live in Eastern Iowa, um, just outside of a small town named Holy Cross. Uh, about 10 years ago, my family and I uh, started kicking around the idea of returning to the farm, and our goal is was to um, raise grain-finished and, and direct market grain-finished beef. Uh, about four years ago, we started renting my wife's home place from her father. Uh, two years ago, we were able to buy the farm. Uh, we remodeled the house, and we currently live on the farm. Uh, the farm consists of 150 acres. There's no pasture. It's all cropland. Uh, we currently raise 
but roughly 50 acres of beans, 50 acres of corn, and 50 acres of alfalfa hay. Um, we own all the equipment necessary to, to support that operation. Um, as I mentioned, unfortunately, the farm has no usable facilities on it, so we're in the process of, of evaluating what facilities we want to put on and what we want to upgrade. Uh, so that's one of the things we're going to be looking, looking to do. Our, our goal is still to uh, buy you know, roughly 500-pound feeders and raise them up and finish them out on grain. Uh, we're trying to avoid the um, traditional feedlot model, but we do want to have a grain-finished animal. Uh, we are limited again because we have no pasture. Some of the, the obstacles that we are facing is uh, I have a lack of knowledge related to finishing beef. Um, again, the lack of facilities. Uh, we have lots of options, so we're trying to understand what, what other people are doing and what options they have and what the recommendations are so we can kind of weigh a lot of different possibilities and determine what works best for us. And then um, I have a significant lack of understanding with regard to um, rules, regulations, laws, licensing, etc. associated with uh, marketing beef directly to consumers. So that's kind of the three areas right now that I see as my immediate obstacles, uh, uh, you know, finishing the cattle themselves, the facilities, and then the lack of understanding of the marketing. I'll pass it back. Well, I'm Shannon um, Eversole, and Bo's here as well. Uh, we are down in Ringgold County in southern Iowa, almost to the Missouri border. We have one farm that is on the border. We are a small cow-calf operation, um, and then we also run custom cows for other people. With our cow-calf operation, we raise Maine on Jew cattle, um, and then we like to finish most everything else as beef, and then we sell bulls and heifers as well. We have both the spring calving herd and a fall calving herd. Our springborn calves are the cattle that we do market some as um, what we call pasture-raised beef, um, which are offered grains, and some are selectively finished out on corn. Um, there's lots of different ways to phrase that, but that's what we call ours, um, and that's what we do. I guess we can get started. Um, what our game plan was is to go through about our operation and how we raise our cattle, and Dave, just chime in with questions as you have any, and then at the end, we'll go through your detailed list of questions that we haven't answered in the middle of everything to make sure that we get your game plan set up for you. So like I said, we are cow-calf operation. Um, our fall-born calves are 100% grass-fed, but our spring-born calves are what we bring in um, here. Now about is when we wean most of our calves and are switching them over to grains. All of our pastures are pretty much native grass. We have big grass pastures. We don't do much intensive grazing with our spring-born calves. We only do that with our grass-fed beef that we're finishing. In the wintertime, we keep most all of our cows out on grass uh, or stockpiled hay, and uh, we use hay and lick tubs to supplement. Just some of the cows out on fresh lick tubs in some stockpiled grass. Docility of the cattle. One thing that I think most people don't stress enough is how calm and quiet your mama cows are, leads to how calm and quiet your calves at weaning time are. This picture here was taken day one of weaning and you can see my little guy there uh, helping Bo feed and the calves are all learning how to eat and doing just fine. The first couple of days we'll dump out grain with buckets or bagged feed and then we'll shake up hay on top because they'll usually start to eat the hay first. I think was this was the, the second feeding so they're they're getting into it a little bit more. You can see our mixed ration here. When we're weaning, we first like to do some uh, cracked corn and uh, bagged ration. After we get them on, going on to feed, eating about 1% of their body weight in the bunks, we'll move them into the deep bedded barn. Um, they have pasture access out the east end. 
and we'll start working them onto the self feeder you can see in the background. We also like to roll out, you can see a, ba a bale of oat straw is what we have this year instead of corn stalks. We like to go onto the self feeders in the winter time simply because it decreases the amount of bucket chores. And once you get a, into that 15, 20 head that are all eaten pretty good, there gets to be a lot of buckets. <laughs> so that's why we like the self feeders. The intake modifiers, I think, is one of the, the things that, that we've discovered that really has allowed us to use the self feeders. I think Bo's more of our, our feed expert. Um, but intake modifiers are, uh, what they do is they limit the amount of grain that an animal will eat from 1% to 2% of their body weight. Uh, some name brands are Accuration from Purina. Cargill makes what they call Ranger. Our local farmers co-op makes an exact -a mix. All of these intake modifiers can, um, or some don't, include um, Remensin or Bovitech in there. So it's just up to you whether you want to use those medicated feeds or whether you don't want to use those medicated feeds. We choose not to use the medicated feeds. We just don't feel as though it's necessary uh, to push ours as hard as what some commercial feeders may want to do. And you can see our self feeders are just creep feeders um, that are used out in the pasture. We just raise the gates and let the calves go. They've got adjustable sliders in the side that you can adjust, you can see in this picture, you can adjust up and down. Like this is in the very beginning, they've got a lot of grain in there, trying to get them to figure out what those feeders are. In our set, we have- Shannon, I got a quick question. Our, yes. Um, the, you mentioned the intake modifiers, and then you, you mentioned medicated feeds. Are they hand in hand, or can you have the intake modifier without medication? In all of the intake modifiers offer non-medicated options. Um, you can get them with or without Bovitech or Remensen. Um, when you run into using Remensen, um, you cannot add your oreomycin uh, antibiotics if you if you choose to do that. We don't. Um, if we have something that needs treated, we stick a needle in it. We don't use feed antibiotics. Um, so you can get them with or without Remensen or Bovitech. Um, and, and also when you mix them, you can have them add antibiotics if you choose to. Um, but pretty much all of them do offer an option without. Um, Those, uh, do, you guys, do you guys mix your own feed and, and just put the additives in or do you get it from the, the elevator pre-mixed? We, we, we get it from the elevator. We don't have any grain. Uh, we run about 1,500 acres of pasture, no grain. So we get everything mixed and delivered from the elevator. Some guys do mix their own. If they have a grinder mixer, um, in your situation, you could grind your own corn, and then probably the Accuration would be the best option. Uh, you can get them all bagged and, and add them yourself. Just the main thing I would say on the intake modifiers is to find out who in your area what companies um, are, are available within your area, whether it's Purina, Cargill, ADM, whatever, they all have some sort of a, uh, a modifier. Some companies call them limiters, um, but find out who, who is in your area and, and develop a relationship with that company as far as to help you out with what program works the best for you. Okay, thanks. So in our situation where we do have the barn, I don't know if you have any cement at all left in your old barnyards, Dave, but it would definitely be helpful to get that definitely. feeder on cement. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any significant cement. Um, it's one of the expenses I think we're going to have to, to bite off when we put up a, some sort of facility. We're going to have to pour cement. Whether or not we pour cement um, for everything or just where they're being fed and then try to use some other substitute, 
underneath the deep packed bedding area is is something I'm still looking to explore. I've had some people tell me that you could there are other things you can put down for underneath the deep packed bedding that are relatively easy to clean under. They're not scrapable like cement, but it might be a short term stopgap to reduce the initial expense at least. Well, in our barn, we only have a 16 foot deep cement pad. And so if you just put a big enough pad to get about eight feet around your feeder, uh, and then around your water, I think that would definitely be sufficient. And then we, in our barn, in the wintertime, we like to mound it up in the center of the barn so that as our pack deepens, they lay on that bedding that's mounded up uh, when they come inside, and then it keeps them dry and warm. And I, I definitely would agree. You don't need much cement at all. Just make your bedding pack and then as you continue through the winter pile it up and then we just scrape our lots every spring i don't think that you need a whole cement yard you might get into some lameness issues if if the calves you buy have that tendency but with just a little bit of cement it should be better on them. do you um, scr um scrape around the the feeders or do you let that deep pack as well we, we try to scrape that um that, that manure can get pretty deep. Seems like they, they like to go a lot while they eat. So um, we try to scrape that weekly. Um, like I said, we've got a 14-foot apron, the full 200-foot length of the barn, but, and we try to scrape that apron weekly. Um, and that manure is usually more liquid, so we do try to handle that immediately and try not to add that to the pack, that, which is behind the apron. Oh, so you scrape it and then scrape it back up onto the pack into the bedding and then cover it, I assume? No, we try to try to scrape that. No, we try to try to scrape that. Yeah, that liquid manure right around the pad yeah, gets liquid. deep otherwise. Where do you store it or how do you store it, I guess, the stuff you scrape? Um, um we, we sometimes we pile it on one end end of the barn otherwise we, we haul it haul it immediately when we can is there a a rule of thumb for how much storage a person should have for um i guess for scraping around a feeder uh, you know i I hear talking to the NRCS that you know they're moving towards um, pushing people to to have manure storage either under roof or a dedicated area outside, and I'm, I, that's one of the questions I have is I don't know how much storage a person needs if you're just going to scrape the feed areas um, per head kind of thing. I think wouldn't they? I don't know if you guys have a feel for that. Yeah, I wouldn't think you'd need that much storage simply because if you're talking, you know, 12 to 24 head, you shouldn't have that much to scrape. You could add it to your bedding pile and just bed over top of it because in your area or even on your own fields, could you bale a bunch of corn stalks and have extra corn stalks? Since we don't have any corn, it's hard to get a hold of. Yeah, corn stalks was what I intended to be my primary bedding. I'm just assuming I can only spread two times a year, spring and fall. So, well, you know, I, I need some place well, to put it the rest of the year, I imagine. Generally with dry manure, you can spread spread about any time as long as it's not muddy and you can get out and do it. Um, with the, the liquid hog manure, they've got regulations on not going on frozen ground uh, type of deal. But on, with dry manure, generally you can spread it whenever you want to. So going through the winter, it wouldn't be that out of line to go spread that as you, as you gather it so that you don't have to store it. Um, but the bedding pack, definitely, we, we let try, I would suggest letting that build and then doing kind of an all in, all out when you, when you remove a group or, or empty the barn in this, you know, spring, go ahead and unload that, you know, before you put your crop in, getting that cleaned out. Otherwise, in the summertime, I think if you just kept building your mound, it should stay dry enough that you could build it higher and higher. And I wouldn't think that it would get too tall to handle. Does your 
Do your yards have any slope or any angles to them? I think that's where the NRCS would be mainly concerned about. The NRCS would be mainly concerned. Yeah, our, our existing cow yard does have slope and angle to it. It does feed down into a significant waterway. So I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to have to put some sort of gut curb around any cement area to kind of capture the runoff. Or some kind of a berm below it above the waterway. That would be a good option to build the berm above the waterway. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I, I'm a little confused about and how to set up how to set up a proper environmentally friendly um, way of handling this. Plus, you know, to be honest, the fertilizer has a lot of or the manure has a lot of value as fertilizer, too. So I'd prefer not to see it run down the side of the hill for that purpose as well. I, you know, the more I capture and get on my crops, the better off I am. Most of the, you know, check, check with your NRCS office for sure. But but most generally, you know, any open lots that are running to a waterway type deal, not necessarily, not necessarily a creek, but if you just have a grass waterway or something. 90% um, of the feedlots that I dealt with, with, with a, as a feed sale, and then um, all set up some kind of a sediment basin above those waterways, below the yard, to, to kind of catch that runoff and slow it down. And generally, that was acceptable and, and allowed. So something like that's pretty simple to do. A dozer could come in and do it in a day for not a whole lot of money. I think it would be a little, little easier to deal with than maybe a, a curb on the concrete. You know, it just depends on, on what you run into and how, you know, how steep it is and how, you know, how steep it is, how far you are from my action, how far you are from my action. So you're talking about just a, a, a dirt mound that would slow the water down, not not really like a lagoon kind of thing, are right, you? Right, right. Just 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 right. kind of like a terrace, just, you know, just a, kind of terrace like a terrace with maybe a, an inlet or a tile, but, but, but make sure it's all seated yeah. down in grass. Make sure it's all seated down in grass. If, if it builds up in there, yeah. if it builds up, you, you know, you go and clean it out every so often to, to keep, you know, from going over the top. And it just kind of catches your your solids and, and lets the water filter down through the waterway then. Okay, well, that's a good idea. I didn't know about that. And, I mean, most of them are on, on enough of a hill that there's a lot of those uh, sediment basins around those feedlots. And they haven't, they haven't shut them down, the DNR has. So as far as I know, that's an acceptable practice as, as long as you're catching that runoff and slowing it down and then letting it filter out through the grass waterway. Well, I imagine too, as far as the DNR is concerned, we're, we're only talking about growing at least initially up to, you know, 30, 40, maybe 50 head at most. So we're not talking hundreds of head. I, I agree. I imagine there's some I, size I, count where, you know, once you get over so many animal units, they get a little more concerned than they would a, a small timer like me. Agree with that, but I, I know I grew up in Illinois, and I go back there now, and, and a lot of those 20, 30 head feedlots are, are gone. The EPA came in and said, if you got water running off, you're done. So it's something that we all need to be thinking about, no matter what the scale of our operation is. Um, if we've got flowable manure running down downhill, we're going to have issues in the future, whether we got 10 head or 1,000 head. Well, I think for me, the, the confined animals, I would definitely make sure the, you know, we capture everything in a, a, a cement area. Uh, the backgrounded animals would probably be the ones that would be more out on the cow yard where they'd be a little more free to roam. Um, but yeah, I think if, if I can get by with just putting a, a, a dirt wall up, I guess, and, and like you said, like almost a terrace kind of arrangement, um, I think that would be advantageous for everybody. Sounds like a great plan. Um, this is just another picture of one of our self feeders. Most of our self feeders hold about three tons. Most yeah. commercial creek feeders will be two to three tons. When you get into order and feed from the co-op, most of the bulk trucks they deliver feed in are three ton holes in each. You know, the ones down here are five are fifteen ton trucks. So there's five five hole compartments that will hold three tons each. So if you can set up in increments of three tons, it generally works in your favor as far as delivery costs and, 
and cheapening up delivery costs on a per ton basis. And now we can get into some of the marketing aspects of our beef. There's two different ways that you can market your beef, which is custom, meaning direct sales of halves and quarters. You can sometimes get away with smaller scale as far as an eighth of a beef or a beef bundle, as long as you sell it while that animal is live. Otherwise, you need to get into the retail sales. In order to do retail sales, you have to have each animal individually state or federally inspected. With you being so close to the border, I'd probably recommend federal inspection because that way you can cross state lines. With the federal inspection, they've got an inspector on site. Go ahead, Dave. So when you say inspected, are you talking about the, the processing facility is inspected? Yes, both the processing facility and each individual animal have to be inspected. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. It's upside down in this picture, right in the middle of the package of one of the ground beef, there's an Iowa shape. You can see with some writing inside of it, that is our Iowa State Inspected logo. Um, and it has the plant number. This was from the Mingo Locker. So it has the Mingo Locker inspection number showing that the inspector was there. Otherwise, if it's federally inspected, it'll be a circle with the USDA symbol in the side inside of it. And the main thing is, is a federally or state inspected facility can do custom harvest, but on the day that you harvest, you need to make sure that the inspector is there and that that individual animal is inspected on the day that it's killed and the day that it's cut. So I assume both inspection, the inspection of the animal and all that happens at the locker on the day you bring it down. It's not like you have to have them come out to the farm or anything or state inspector watches the animal be harvested, um, making sure everything's done properly, the animal was healthy enough, and then again, make sure that make sure that it's cut properly, cleanly, there's no liver issues. He ages the animal um, to make sure it's plus or minus 36 months, uh, and that will determine how, what cuts you can have or can't have as far as the age verification goes. So yes, you need to both plan ahead for choosing your locker and choosing your harvest date. You need to make sure you let that locker know that I'm going to sell these as retail. So I need to have them federally inspected or state inspected. How do you verify the age of the animal? The inspector will age the animal by teeth. And then if you have source verification records, meaning we have birth records, so we can turn in our birth records, especially with the grass-fed beef, because the teeth will be a lot more worn down on a grass-fed beef, so sometimes they like to call them older than what they are, um, especially with our younger animals. Most grass-fed, they like to call plus 36 months, even though we have age verification that says they're not. In your case, you can get age verification if you buy them individually from, instead of going through a sale barn, if you go direct through a producer, you can get their age verification. I'm sure there's somewhere where you can find just a simple basic form is all our inspectors ask for is your calving records. If you could get a copy of their calving records, that will serve as age verification. Uh, it needs to have a tag number on it the date they were born, and the location they were born. Can you explain again what the age verification is used for? Verification is used for how they are allowed to be cut. If an animal is plus 36 months, you cannot have any bones that are attached to the spine saved or kept. You can't have your T-bones if they're plus 36 months. That's the main difference. I see. So once you go over that 36, there are limitations, but under 36, there are not. Am I understanding correct. that correct? Yes. It all goes back to the BSE thing. Under 36 months, you can keep 
whatever your locker or your inspector will allow you to keep. Our inspector still does not allow us to keep any tripe or any um, internal guts. Uh, we get to keep our organs, but not uh, the intestinal tract or the stomach linings. They also will not allow us to keep hooves. Each inspector is a little bit different. The main thing when you're marketing your beef is you're not marketing meat nine days out of ten. You're marketing your farm. You're marketing your story. You're marketing how you do things on your place. It's important to let each individual customer, even a wholesale customer, know exactly what you do and how you do it. You know, whether you choose to add antibiotics or whether you don't choose to add antibiotics, whether you choose to be certified organic or whether you choose to just raise your animals naturally um, and sharing your story and sharing your family I think is the most important thing that we can do as farmers and ranchers is to advocate to the general public public as far as marketing goes as far as marketing go ahead Dave well, I was just going to say along those lines, um, we were, we've were we been thinking right along the lines of what you're saying is that we're, we're marketing our story and our image more than the beef itself almost. Um, and one of the things that we learned when we were living up in Minnesota um, in town before we moved to the farm, um, we got to know a number of direct marketers up there. And, and one of the things they did was um, they encouraged farm visits, you know, come out to the farm. Um, you know, get to know us, see our operation, you know, feel good about us kind of thing. And I guess I'm wondering, do you have any opinion on such things like liability of having people come out or how to, how to approach um, or how to deal with people when they come out to the farm who aren't necessarily, you know, having a farm background? Um, I guess I was wondering if you can give me any insights on, on if you do that and, and what you've learned doing that end up doing a lot of it because we are an hour and a half from most of our markets. However, we're very open to it. We do have farm visits. I think the main thing is, is to have a big liability policy. That's the main thing my insurance guy told us is protecting yourself with that liability that way because the bottom line comes down to no matter what kind of insurance you have, no matter what kind of policies that are out there, someone might try to sue you. So you want to make sure you have enough insurance that covers more than your farm. They go after the insurance. They don't go after your farm. But yeah, sharing your story through farm visits is a great thing. Um, having open house days. I know like the farm crawl in southeastern Iowa is an amazing event that gets so many people out to local farms that shares each and every part of their story. I know a lot of those farmers their biggest day of the year is farm crawl. And I know it'll be two to three farmers markets all in one day. They'll have two to 3,000 people at their farm actively purchasing on that day. So if you can set up any sort of activity on your farm, that would definitely help. I try to do- Any suggestions on the activities? <laughs> there are so many different things that you could do as far as the activities go. Uh, you know, if you are close enough, you could do anything as far as a corn maze, a potluck, just for your customers. If you do halves and quarters, you know, a farm potluck would be a great idea. I end up doing a lot more social media because we are a little bit farther away than what most people want to drive. I, I share our day-to-day -day activities, the silly, crazy pictures. Uh, are what get people in bar, involved with our farm and our ranch. And I try to keep those people active on Facebook and sharing posts and crazy stories and blogging because that's my way of marketing because I am, am not close enough for them to come visit me whenever they feel like it. That was most of my details because I wanted to go through on how you set your things up and how you set your pasture up.
Did it give you more ideas, Dave, on how you think that you want to do things? Oh, yes, it's been a great help, um, especially the marketing stuff. I learned stuff that I hadn't known, like I didn't know about the inspections. Um, are there any local inspections that you need to deal with, like local health inspectors? And um, I'm also curious about, do you store your product, you know, at the locker or do you store it back on your farm, transportation, those kind of things. When you're transporting it, how do you transport it? that is one place I definitely left off. Yes, we store beef on farm. Um, we have several different freezers. Uh, the state of Iowa um, Department of Inspections and Appeals is who offers your farmer's market license. And they can also help you get set up to uh, have your freezers inspected. And then when we transport to and from, we have big what we call super freezers. Uh, they're meant to hold uh, deer and game. They stay frozen for seven days. The main thing I wait for before I transfer beef is after the locker has harvested and cut the beef, I make sure I wait at least three to four days before I transport that beef. That way it's fully frozen in their super freezers. There will be no tender spots at all in the meat. And then transport them in the freezers uh, or freezers, excuse me, in the coolers, I like to do our custom direct from the locker to their home. I like to deliver it to their house because they don't get to come to the farm and talk. That's one more place that I can talk to them and touch their beef with them and go through them, carry it down to their basement with them. When we do farmer's markets, we'd use dry ice. Uh, most of your local grocery stores can get a hold of dry ice. If they don't have it, um, they can get it for you. If they know ahead of time, every Saturday, I come and get two blocks of dry ice, that sort of thing. Um, but the inspected freezers, when you have the inspected freezers at your house, the main things the inspectors are looking for is a clean location. No animals are stored in the location. There's no rodents or pests. It's technically a warehouse license is what you're getting. And then they don't like to see any personal food inside of the retail freezers. Uh, we had initially we had a separate compartment for our personal food and we've moved into separate freezers for our retail freezers. At farmers. Okay. So like on, at our place, we have a three car garage. Would it be acceptable to put a freezer in the third stall of the garage and have that just for retail beef or do they expect you to have it in a in a isolated building At, in that extra area as long as there's not a lot of dirt and debris coming in and out of your garage and it's kept reasonably clean and you have a road management uh, plan basically we have uh we have live traps that sort of thing uh to prevent a rodent infestation or else you have to have a contract with a pest management company. And for the freezers you have, I, I thought you mentioned a super freezer, but I'm assuming that's the lockers freezer, correct? Freezers are, I think he said 10 below. They're blast coolers. So they freeze it much quicker. And then our, Freezers at home are just deep freezes. That's what we choose to use rather than an upright. The deep freeze tends to stack a little bit better in our opinion. The uprights don't quite hold as much when you're moving larger quantities of the same th sort of thing. But your deep freeze at home is just a standard deep freeze that you could pick up from Lowe's or somebody, not a, not a special super freezer, correct? It is a standard chest freezer and we just turn them down as low as they go. And that way we have more than one. We can also defrost one at a time. That's another reason I like the chest freezers rather than the upright freezers because the upright freezers uh, periodically defrost. Each one's set a little different, but the chest freezers don't automatically defrost. We do that uh, once every two months or so. And then you said when you go to farmer's markets, you just use dry ice. Is that correct? Dry ice to 
transport to and from. Uh, we have larger coolers, like those are my super coolers that hold for seven plus days. Uh, one thing that I like to do in our coolers at farmer's markets is have a towel over the top because that way as you're getting in and out, only part of it is uncovered and it will keep the cold air down. It seems to stay colder better. Uh, you'll also need a farmer's market license for your county. And uh, depending on your farmer's market, you may have someone come and inspect. We usually have one about three times a summer. And then again, at the winter's farmer's market, the guys will come around and they, um, they just take the temperature off the top of the cooler to make sure that everything is below, I think, 42 degrees is their standard. And then they also make sure you have the proper licensing because what you are selling is a potentially hazardous material is how they classify it because it's meat. So I want to make sure I understand. So at the farmer's market, you use a super cooler. And as long as it stays below 42 degrees, you pack it with dry ice, they're okay with that. You don't have to have a, a, a running freezer, I guess. Correct. We do not keep a running freezer. I take coolers in the back of a pickup and I unload them by myself half the time. So I don't keep them uh, too big or too full. And then just the dry ice, a couple pieces on top will go a long way. When you sell at the farmer's market, do you sell packs or bundles or do you sell individual cuts? market I usually do individual cuts if I have an extra supply of beef I'll do some grilling bundles uh, or some packages depending on what I feel like and what I have available at that time uh, each farmers market is going to be a little bit different on what type of customer that is the downtown Des Moines farmers market is a lot of individual cuts that's the type of customer whereas some of the other markets that we've done they are more rural, so they do shop a little less frequently, so they tend to buy uh, bundles. In Shannon, this is Megan. I have a question for you. Do you ever get requests for fresh, fresh meat? Um, and have you ever thought about selling a fresh product? Requests for fresh meat. What I ask them to do is to purchase ahead of time prior to harvest, simply because usually when they want fresh meat, it's an individual's specific cut. They want something different. They want something a little bit weird. Uh, we don't have quite the issues that perhaps you would with chicken and other types of animals. I know uh, there would be much more reasons as far as texture go with uh, chickens. I know a lot of other people like the fresh meat and chicken specifically. And Shannon, I just saw a question from Wendy Johnson asking, how do you set your price at the farmer's market? Price is a difficult thing for most everybody. I think the main issues that I have with, with people setting prices is you need to make sure that whether you have an off-farm job or not, whether you have outside income, is to make sure that you're setting your prices so that the costs that go into the animal are being reflected in the actual price. Meaning you have to account for some sort of land costs. You have to account for the actual animal costs, the feed costs, the fencing costs, and then hopefully you get to include some labor costs. Um, I think that you should generally look around your area and I don't like to compare prices, but I would make sure that you're not drastically higher or drastically lower than someone else. If you're drastically lower than someone else, most of those people don't last very long. And that's because they're not accurately reflecting their true costs in their packaged products. I see Mary has a question about how to manage the meat inventory. That is a difficult task for the best of us. Um, a couple of things that I have done in my freezers 
um, are the, if you go to the typical grocery store, they all have the reusable grocery bags nowadays. I buy those in every single different color I can find from Menards to every grocery store has their own color. I buy all the different colors. And then I segregate my meat by cut inside of those bags at the time that I pack them into my deep freeze. It allows me to lift them in and out of the deep freeze easily uh, by type of cut. In addition, then I can count those easily and keep track of how much of what cut I have a little bit better. Our ground beef, I actually leave in the trays from the locker uh, and put them down into one section of a freezer. And I know that each tray holds approximately 48 pounds. And then I can just count trays to know how much ground beef I have. But managing retail inventory is a very difficult process when you're selling retail cuts. I think that when you're starting out, the best way is definitely to go custom. I would definitely rest, recommend when you're starting to sell halves and quarters as much as you can and start talking to more people and marketing in the very beginning, we marketed through Craigslist. I did four different uh, farmers markets. Becoming really involved in the local foods industry or market industry activity, everything in your area, becoming involved is a great way to find customers and to learn more on a day to day basis. In addition to farmers markets, we do several different retail outlets. We do the Iowa Valley Food Co-op up in Northeastern Iowa, Cedar Rapids. We do the Iowa Food Co-op based out of Des Moines. Those two co-ops are online farmer's market type settings. Um, it's iowavalleyfood.com and iowafood.coop. And there individuals can purchase piece by piece. In addition, we also deal with um, two local grocery store type cooperatives here in Ames and Des Moines and they purchase once a month in larger quantities uh, we do wholesale pricing for them as long as they purchase at least a hundred pounds at a time you can take the next step and you could go into larger grocery chains but I have not had a great response with larger chains as of yet simply because of supply and demand my supply um, does not meet my demand. I always have greater demand than I have supply. Even, even every year we add five to 10 more head and it just, this market is growing dramatically. So. How many head do you market a year, Shannon? We market about 20 head custom and about 30 head farmer's market, uh, and retail outlets. Do you sell primarily at farmer's markets and retail and direct, or do you do any like a mail order kind of thing where you, you ship a ways? Is it all direct delivery, I guess, or do you do any mail order? ship a little bit mail order um, most of those customers come to us through our website or friends and family locally that buy through us and then um, visitors that come to the downtown Des Moines farmers market and we will ship to them as well uh, we've got several customers in Colorado and California that buy from us consistently and then we've got here and there uh, we we've done in the past some um, Christmas presents uh, I've marketed those in the winter time and people will buy small bundles and send them to friends and family across the country. Can you explain how you handle the shipping of a meat product? <clears throat> of course, the number one thing is that you have federally inspected meat. If you're going to ship them across state lines or else they have purchased the animal uh, prior to harvest, that portion of the animal prior to harvest. We ship in styrofoam containers that we recycle from our local veterinarian's office. You can also purchase styrofoam insulated containers. Uh, we like to fill them as full as possible. 
Um, I'm trying to think of sizes here. Our typical cooler is about 18 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches, and it'll hold about 40 pounds. You can put up to five pounds of dry ice in that. You cannot exceed five pounds of dry ice. The number one thing is to make sure it's as full as you can possibly get it. Have newspapers on the top. Uh, have the tape wrapped all the way around so there's not as much air to escape. And then wrap the package from top to bottom and side to side circularly in tape at least twice on each side. We ship FedEx ground. We ship on Mondays and Tuesdays only. It gets to our California customers on Friday. I've shipped to California in August and haven't had issues as long as the package is full. I can't stress that enough because that's the only time I've had issues. Wendy asked, how long can you keep cuts in a deep freeze? The USDA recommends that you don't that meat stored in a deep freeze will last 12 months. Other places say 24 months. Typically, 6 to 12 months is the longest I like to have them in there. Um, we've eaten some personally that's been in there longer, but I don't like to sell it older than about 9 months. I'm just curious, back on the shipping thing, you said that uh, the styrofoam containers you use will hold about 40 pounds. I'm assuming you pass the shipping costs on to the, the buyer, but I'm curious, roughly what is the, the shipping cost to say ship to Colorado from central Iowa? From business account, we can typically get Colorado shipping costs for about that 40 pound box in the, the 30 to 60 range. It depends on how rural they are. Uh, I've found a, a big variance, whether they're in town or outside of town. Those zip codes will, will vary a lot. You can go on to fedex.com and get shipping quotes. Just make sure you accurately depict the size of your box and the weight of your box. Other things that we have Oh, I'm also curious. I'm also curious. Do you have to deal with sales tax? It is a food product. As long as you're not selling uh, a cooked product, meaning a prepared product, you don't have to deal with sales tax. And that information is what I was told by the the Food Safety Department in Iowa, the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals. A couple other things that we haven't touched yet on, Dave, that I know are going to be important to you. Vaccinations. Our, my main question to you is where are you going to purchase these animals from? Are you going to purchase them direct from a, be a breeder, directly off their farm, or are they going to go through a sale barn and then you're going to bring them home? I would prefer to get them direct from a breeder, but I don't have anything lined up at this time. So chances are, at least starting out, I'm anticipating I'll have to get them through a sales barn. Direct through a sale barn, I would recommend that you, there is a green tag program that you could purchase animals from, that you know exactly what they've been vaccinated with, uh, what they've been castrated with, and it's done by a veterinarian and certified by a veterinarian. They all have a green metal clip inside their ear. They've been weaned, I think, at least three weeks. They've get, been given two rounds of vaccinations and wormed and castrated. Oh, both says one round. They've been given and castrated. If you can buy them from the sale barn, I would buy them green tagged unless you know the person at the sale barn that you're purchasing from. Even then, I would probably vaccinate them once you got them home and be prepared to treat them. If there's been any sort of sickness in their barn, you'll probably experience that. One other thing that... We yeah, I'm a, little, thing that I'm a little nervous getting from the sales barn, but like I said, until I can, I can line up direct sources, I, I don't know that I have much of a choice. Hey, you know, if you could find a group of three to six calves 
I mean, we can even help you source cattle down here or up there. PFI does have a great network of beef producers. I actually know of an organic producer um, over by Grinnell that sells all of his calves straight off the cow. I'm sure that we can hook you up with someone directly, uh, especially to purchase in that six to 12 at a time range. That's one thing that we thought of as far as your operation goes. You had said that you wanted to have some in a confinement area and some on the cow lots. I guess I would rotate in and out groups of about six to 12 head, six to 12 head twice a year in the beginning while you're getting started. Were you thinking that size groups or were you thinking that you purchase them one or two at a time? Oh, one of the considerations we're thinking about is we want to try to spread them out as much as we can so that we can keep our, our inventory steady and manage it a little bit better. So if we're, if, if we're not able to sell, we could, you know, sell them to a sales barn when they, when they get fat or in, if we are moving product, then, you know, we could send them down to the locker. So, yeah, we're kind of thinking in, in terms of, you know, starting with a first batch of, you know, maybe even just three or four and then maybe, you know, a few weeks or a month later buy another three or four, stick to that, that six to 12 really in that first section of the year and then, and then, you know, buy another six to 12, maybe six months later, and then we'll see how it's going from there. As far as simplicity goes and the size of your location and everything with with putting in waters, putting in fences, all those sorts of things, probably starting with two groups would work great. That way you could have one more backgrounding pen and one pen that's going more into, into finishing type cattle. Um, and that way you could rotate them in and out. I think that you'll find that in the finishing group, you can still harvest them slowly because there will be Cattle that naturally grow faster than others and cattle that naturally grow slower than others. One, one thing I would caution on, uh, and, and they, you know, that's whether it's us or anybody, when, when you add by cattle and co-mingle different groups of cattle, you know, if you're talking about buying four and then in a month buy another four and then in a month buy another four, it, you know, if you don't have separate pens to keep them in and get them started, and get them get them rolling through that first you know 30 days to get them acclimated and get those vaccines working in them um, you can you will run into a lot more sickness and animal health issues by intermixing those those groups of calves um, and if if you do get to a point where you can source them from a uh, an angus breeder i see you want to use angus genetics it, when you get to a point that you can source them from an Angus breeder and develop that relationship, you know, most of the, most, most cow, cow calf guys, you know, we, we can if you calve in the spring or fall or both, you know, you calve for 60 days, you wean your calves and, and you want to ship them all. You know, most of them are, are going to want to sell all their calves at once. Um, so for me, if you can get to that point and develop that relationship, you know, I would suggest doing that and being able to, to maybe get, you know, a little larger group and try to not co-mix different groups of calves from an animal health standpoint. And, and like Shannon's saying, you can stagger your harvest dates pretty easy. Um, you know, you know, even, even there, if they're the same genetics, um, on, on a smaller operation like this, you can, kind of gauge, did, you know, whatever finishness level you want to get to. Um, I mean, if you want to try to feed those cattle to prime or choice or, or however you want to do it, you can kind of gauge that and, and adjust those harvest dates as you go and stagger them that way. To me, I would rather rather see you do it that way than, than try to co-mingle calves as they come in. Okay, yeah, I guess I hadn't given that any thought. I do like that idea. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't given thought to the the possible hazards of commingling animals from different sources in and different ages and bringing them in and and uh, separated by weeks. So that's good information. That's good to know.
that's one of our main reasons why we have extra freezers is because I'd rather harvest animals when they're ready and disconnect freezers as I sell uh, and have a larger storage at a given point than have to worry about setting the calves up. Even all of our calves that are born, you know, within 30 to 60 days of each other are all, are all going to finish a little bit different. So if you can walk into that sale barn and buy a group of calves from one guy, even if they're, you know, you buy some of the lighter weight calves and the heavier weight calves from that one guy's herd, that could help you a lot too, uh, to buy the lighter and the heavier of his calves. So I got a question. Um, I like the idea of, of trying to source it from somebody and you'd mentioned that, you know, there may be resources through PFI. I might be able to find somebody. So here's a, here's a question. How far would the maximum distance one would recommend for, for hauling, you know, say five, four or 500 pound freshly weaned, um, steers? You know, is there a, is there a, uh, rules of thumb on how far you want to haul them or what kind of weather conditions you want to try to deal with? Obviously you don't want it to be a blizzard, but. Tons of cattle hauled from clear out in Montana to Iowa every year. Um, the main thing I would do is try to know what, what you've got coming and, and try to make sure you've got, as far as knowing what vaccinations they've had, what kind of a nutritional program they've had, whether or not they've been creep fed, if they're, if they're started 45 days after they're weaned, so they're eating feed. Um, you know, one thing I would suggest when you do receive cattle, make sure you, um, generally you tend to, to run a high roughage, low starch diet on, on receiving cattle, but um, Cargill has a particular product that I believe in a lot and use, uh, it's called Nutri-Beef Transition Mineral. And the main thing to me on receiving cattle and, weaning calves is is make sure you've got a, a high plane of nutrition you don't you know you, you don't want those animals to get behind on a on a, a vitamin mineral level um, it'll weaken their immune system and also you want to make sure those animals are on a a gaining plane of nutrition so that you're not shorting them on energy either when they get shorted on energy is when they'll get sick on you and, and if, if you can, uh, like the transition mineral product, if, if you can get that in them, I, I, I run that the first two weeks on everything. When we wean, if you can get that in them, that's gonna get your, your higher levels of organic trace minerals in them. Uh, there's yeast in there to help boost their rumen function. Um, you get those things in them, it'll help boost their immune system and it should help you avoid any, any animal health issues where you got to be treating cattle or, or medicating them. So do you have a uh, preference, I guess? Uh, you, you mentioned a, a high roughage diet. Is there a preference between, say, dry hay, baleage, um, other options, I guess? Um, what about, like, corn silage as a finishing um, feed ration? Uh, and I guess on a side question that too, are there, are there feed rations that produce historically more flavorful product that perhaps maybe aren't the best from an efficiency standpoint or doesn't that really matter? I really think, you know, when it comes to weaning calves, definitely stay away from the silages, the baleage, uh, stick with the dry product. Um, what you run into with those, uh, the fermentation process on those increases the acid level in them, and actually you can un you can get the rumen out of balance, and then cattle can become more acidic and become acidotic, and that's when you get sick and you get bloats, and you kill the microbes in the rumen, the the, the bugs. Um, so on on young cattle, you definitely want to stay away from those products. Um, I. Silage is a really good feed for finishing cattle. A lot of people think it's it's too high of a price as far as what it actually costs. I, I like it myself. Um, it, you know, it depends on your area if you want to feed your byproduct, the byproducts that are available. If there if there's byproducts available, um, generally generally what you'll run into depending on your scale, um, a lot of the byproducts 
in the wet form are harder to handle because of the mold on you. If you don't go through enough of them, you can't keep them fresh and they'll get really nasty. Um, and cause sickness. And you can cause sickness. Yeah, you can you can throw cattle off feed with them. You can, um, I think it's listeria you can cause through mold. Um, there, there, there's issues you can run into with, with wet feeds like that. So if you're not on a, on a big enough scale to go through a, whatever size load that you can get within, you know, eight to 10 days, you probably don't want to be using wet byproducts. Um, dry byproducts are, are a, a relatively cheaper source of protein. Um, if you don't use dry bright products, you know, if you're just looking at like a corn mix with some silage, you still need more protein. Um, so byproducts, dry byproducts, corn gluten, dry distillers grains are, are relatively affordable sources of protein. That ration in that bunk right there we're starting those calves on is about 60% soybean hull pellets and some cracked corn and a little bit of protein um, with the transition mineral. Uh, in it. Um, as far as rations affecting the flavor of beef, now there are a lot of people that personally believe that these high byproduct diets that we're feeding in the conventional feedlots harm. They don't. I, they don't produce as flavorful a a product as the old corn diets. The the higher the starch. And you're getting your starts from your corn, the faster the animal generally gets fat. Um, you got to be careful with that because too much starch will blow them as well. But I I grew up, you know, my uncle we we finished everything on on self feeders with ground ear corn with alfalfa in it for protein and a round bale of hay and a bale ring and. And those cattle were finished by the time they were 13 months old. And I, I swear to this day, I've never tasted beef that good. So to me, you know, if if I could pick what I was going to do in my production here and do whatever I wanted to, we'd have an old corn crib full of ground ear corn. And, and that's what I'd eat myself. But um, I think that's one thing we kind of left out in our talk earlier. We always have free choice hay. To yeah. make sure those calves can eat as much hay as they want to, in addition to their diet. Now, now, if you're on a large enough scale that you're using a TMR wagon, and, and like I said, mixing ground hay, silage, distillers, whatever, generally you don't have to have loose free choice hay. If you're feeding them twice a day in, or day once a day, twice a day in a bunk with a TMR wagon. Um, as long as you make sure that grind on that hay is, is at least, you know, at least wider than the width of their nose between their nostrils, then, then you should be getting enough scratch out of that to keep their room and going and you don't need that extra long stem hay. The way we feed things, we keep it out there no matter what. Um, you know, we don't, we don't finish cattle conventionally like that. Um, Number one, you know, with 40, 50 head around, I can't, I can't keep wet feed fresh. And uh, if I'm not around, she doesn't like starting a tractor every day. So It doesn't make sense to start a tractor every day for 50 head, in my opinion. But I don't like tractors. Well, no, I agree with you. That we're Obviously, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going to be very small under 40 head probably it's one of the reasons why i'm interested in the self feeder it doesn't make sense to have a tmr when you're only you know feeding 30 40 50 head um you know it saves on the labor um i was thinking about doing the uh, free choice hay as well i'm assuming for the finishing cattle you, you know you could do free choice baleage or would you not recommend that either i probably would not free choice baleage from from the standpoint, again, getting into an, an acidotic level in the stomach, um, you know, finishing cattle, you're already pushing the starch levels. Probably you're probably going to be pushing more corn than, you know, than ideal from a rumen health standpoint. Um, a lot of, you know, the last 15 years, people have forgotten that you can feed cattle corn. The byproducts have gotten so cheap that everybody's fed them. And, and, and that's the only way people think you can feed cattle. But 
from an from an acid standpoint, you know, the the starch and the acid, I'd, I'd worry about running into issues. I think you'd be better with dry hay on a, with finishing. Um, again, it just depends on how fast you're trying to finish those cattle. If you're really trying to crank them and get them to to gain four or five pounds a day, um, but if you also if you're using one of one of the 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 intake modifiers like the Accuration product, you definitely want to keep long stem available for them um, because, again, that's part of what helps those products limit their intake is, is having that long stem available to keep that room in health. Uh, an animal's got to have roughage to scratch the inside of that room and to make it work. So on grain diets, whether whether you've got some kind of a roughage in that mix, or again, we, we prefer the, the free choice long stem hay, you've got to have something to scratch that room in. You, they're not like pigs, you can't feed them straight, you know, high energy, low roughage diets. Okay, well that makes sense. I, I guess the only reason why I was asking about Bela just because I don't know how it's like where you're at, but we get an awful lot of rain up here, and it's, sometimes I can get very frustrated trying to get my hay up. So I was thinking baleage might make it a little easier to get that first crop up, but you know, dry hay is what I bale now, so um, it, it wouldn't be a change for what I'm doing now. Uh, I guess another question, I guess to clarify maybe what I was kind of thinking about doing and what I'm asking is if this makes sense to you, uh, we want to try to use as much of the the product we raise on the farm ourselves to feed the cattle uh, as opposed to buying you know stuff from the feed mill um, so i guess i was thinking you know we'd be doing free choice hay um, grinding our own corn and then maybe adding some some gluten or some disti dry distillers grain um, obviously i'd have to work with somebody to actually balance the ration to, to you know come up with a a good program but does that seem like a reasonable approach to you or do you have any other recommendations beyond that yeah i think i think you could get you know be fairly successful doing it that way uh you know like the self feeders like i said i'd, I'd be very i definitely be careful on on whether or not you use an intake modifier if you don't um you can run into some issues we've had some guys try that when i worked here at the co-op I, I and we've we've had some wrecks and, and you'll kill cattle if you're not careful without those modifiers and, and you can even have issues with the modifiers but they make it a lot safer to use the self feeders uh i definitely think you could uh Say our uh, the the Ranger product with Cargill, it's it's a little lower inclusion rate than the Accuration from Purina is, um, so you buy less of it. But you're but part of that is um, you can get a BP version of that that is to be used with byproducts. So you can instead of buying more of that feed, you can put less of that in of the BP than than the plain. And then you use your gluten or distillers for protein, and then that you can make a very safe ration with that. Again, given providing access to the the long stem hay for the rumen health. How do you know how much to? I guess they, maybe they tell you this when you buy it, but how do you put in? How do you know how much to put in to limit to say two pounds or, or two percent body fat? I mean um, body weight, you know how do you control how how do you control how much they eat i guess by using the limiter i guess is my question those products have kind of a set standard as far as kind of what their research has shown where to start them at um, generally you can follow those standards to get started and you just got to feel each group of cattle out some some groups will really blow through it and eat way more than they're supposed to and and other groups you know don't like it and they won't touch it and so you got you know, you start those products out low, um, as far as a low inclusion rate, and then then you feel out how much they're eating, and, and then you you adjust it accordingly as you go. So this is Megan. I just want to interject here. We have 15 minutes left. 
So if any of the participants have questions, please type them in the chat box. And then I wanted to address uh, Jay Franzen's question here, which is uh, back to the marketing side of things. Do you get the beef graded at the locker? I guess that would go into marketing direction. You can get it graded at the locker if you have a federal inspector or if you have a state grader come out. We have had Joe Sellers um, come out and grade some of our cattle just for our purebred records is what we did that for. If you want to sell, I guess when we're getting more into the corn finished beef, it might help to have them graded because you could sell some prime cuts. You could sell some of those sorts of things. One thing I don't think we've touched on with Dave is if you, um, he wants to use the Angus beef. If you see these calves in the bunk on this picture, all but one of those calves will go, would be considered Angus beef. If they met the choice standards and they had 70%, 70% black hide, um, you cannot use the certified Angus beef label, logo, words, anything of that nature, unless you have them harvested at a certified Angus facility and you have them graded by the certified Angus grader. But if you have someone come to the locker, the federal inspectors can grade them for you. They can certify them choice or certify them prime or certify them select. If you choose to do that, you can definitely do that and you could definitely use that in your marketing. You can you can market them as Angus, but you cannot use the CAB. What does that stand for? Certified Angus. Certified Angus beef. Okay, thanks. Facilities we haven't really talked about. As Bo and I were discussing your possible setup, one thing that we think in our own life is simplicity is better. Um, if you work with your cattle, walk your pens, uh, talk to your calves, don't have them scared of you, a simple setup will get you a lot farther along. Uh, having a, a small working alley, um, an eight foot alley that you could load out of or that also turns into a working shoot area would be a great option for something of this setup. Even just a lean-to, a small, you know, if you're talking 30 head, you want to give each animal a sheet of plywood to be able to stand inside, but yet still have outside access. But that way they can get inside under the shelter if it does get bad weather. Um, uh, I guess what, what I've been kicking around the idea lately of doing is, I guess they call them monoslopes now. When I was a kid, we just called them you know, open face loafing sheds. Um, I'm thinking about putting up something along those lines, um, thinking along the lines of 40 feet uh, deep, um, maybe to start with 40 feet wide where it could be separated into two 20 foot pens. Uh, one of the things I guess I got a question is, um, you know, you read a lot, they, everybody seems to be going full confinement. Uh, it almost seems to me you should have a little bit of space that they could get outside, you know, outside of the shed. Um, and, you know, so I guess one of the questions is, do you, if, if I was to do that, would you recommend feeding outside or still trying to feed inside? And, and what kind of ratio would a person recommend for outside space versus inside shed space? Or, or doesn't it really matter? The way our barn's set up, it is a, quote, full confinement. 40 square feet per head supposed to be set up to finish 200 head. Um, we never we never stock it over 50 percent, and I, I like the i I like the idea of access to outside and and we allow access to outside when it's feasible. When it gets muddy, when it gets nasty out. I like the ability to be able to lock the gate and keep them in out of the weather. Um, we've used it for calving in as well, but, but. Especially freshly weaned calves. They're too stupid to stay inside. <laughs> right. We've had a snowstorm in August or October, November, early <laughs> March. <laughs> we, we lock them in. 
because those freshly weaned calves just don't pay attention enough and they don't stay inside like you think they should to stay healthy. Right. But, but the, you know, to me, if, if you allow access to outside, I generally tend to try to allow access to at least two to three times outside what they have inside. And, and there, there's some days that we may just open it and let them out just to run around for a couple hours before we put them back in to get some exercise. You know, I, it, they get bored being in there. Um, again, we don't try to use it as a total confinement. Um, like you think of like a slatted barn where that's all they get. That's all they ever get until they die. Um, We've seen those confinement barns. Management is really important in those confinement barns. If you don't keep them clean, they will get way too deep, way too quick. Wendy's got a question down there about um, lambs and feeder calves. And, and, and Jerry chimed in as well. They do just fine together unless you get a nasty calf that has fun chasing a lamb. We have our show calves in with our, our lambs and some of the our girls' calves will get just nasty with those sheep and they just don't get along what, well together. I think it's kind of a, a personality issue on both the sheep. I know our, our ram does not do well with the calves. Yeah. He yeah. likes to fight too much. And Jerry's absolutely right. You make sure when you're when you're feeding that you you got serious issues if if your your lambs get into your calf feed and they, they get too much copper, you will kill them. Um, so you got to really be careful how you're feeding them the grain and, and what you're feeding them. Um, out on out on a pasture setting where there's not a grain availability. Uh, you know, just double check what mineral supplementation type you've got out there. Um, sheep are very copper sensitive and you, you'll, you'll end up with dead sheep if you're not careful. Too much copper will, will kill them. So I have another um, facility question. You, you use self feeders and you said that for the most part um, when you're finishing them, they're confined. Do you have any recommendations on how to, or, you know, how to deal with the self feeders and cleaning around them in an efficient manner? I guess to keep that area clean. You know, what kind of arrangement do you do that allows you for efficient cleaning? I guess. Like we said earlier, our creep feeders, so they are on wheels. Um, so for us, it's pretty simple. We pull the feeders out of the barn and we clean. Um, one thing I, I do need to, to clarify, I don't think Shannon said it earlier, but on our pasture raised beef, they are in the barn through the winter. Um, once it turns green grass and, and the weather is nice, those cattle go out of the barn to grass paddocks with those self feeders. So they at that point are offered free choice hay, grass or self feeder, whichever they prefer to eat. Um, again, we're not focused on how fast we get them to where they want to be. We're more focused on how we take care of them until they get there. Um, but, but part of our pasture raised program is that they're confined when they have to be, but when, when it's available, we get them back out. So they have room to roam and do what they want to do. I think when you're this is Megan. I, yep. I have a question for Shannon um, and Bo. How do you really know when your animal is finished and when you have that the fat cover that you want? Um, it, it, is it a, a, a measurement of weight or is it through body condition scoring or how do you determine that? Generally, you know, it depends how it depends how you want to finish them. In, in our program, we don't necessarily want them conventionally thinking fat, but if, if, if you're wanting to get them fat and finished and actually finish them like conventional cattle, there's, there's really three areas to look at on the owl. Uh, the, first, it, the first area you can look at uh, is your cod fat. Uh, down where the scrotum is. When that starts filling with fat, you can tell that animal's getting fat. Around the tail head, there you can see fat deposits. Um, 
down in the brisket area, those cattle will get really wide between their front legs. And, and when you stand to the side, that brisket will come forward from their front legs a considerable amount before it goes up into their neck. And, and I guess a fourth also, you can look at their backs. A lot of cattle, as they get fat, will get a dimple in the middle of their back. Um, so you can, you can look there. Uh, the more you do it, you'll get to where you can kind of guess weights and understand weights. And in and, and different cattle, you know, will, you know, some cattle will be finished and done at 1,050 pounds and other cattle will weigh 1,500 and won't have an ounce of fat on them. So that really depends on the type of cattle that you're feeding. So as far as weights go, that's more how we do it. We, we with our genetics, choose to say when these cattle get to this weight, we're going to send them, whether they're selects or choice, doesn't really matter so much to us. Our customers tend to prefer a leaner product anyway. So we look at more like a finished end weight than we do whether they're truly finished with fat than, than most conventional people. Um, I see a question from Larry about uh, uh, intake limiter using salt. I, I I worked with a customer that just passed away here this last fall, and he's probably one of the smartest cattlemen that I've ever had a chance to learn from. And and you know he always talked about for years they just they just finished uh, old salty corn. They throw throw salt and corn in the self feeders and let them roll, and and it worked great. Uh, the way he talked, you know, ten to twenty percent salt in a in a diet would would hold them to, a, you know, a pretty safe uh, intake level, but a lot of people don't do it anymore. Um, with most people making the move to, to steel cell feeders over over wooden ones, you, you're right, uh, it's pretty hard on them, but um, it could still be done. I mean, it just depends on how you're set up and, and what you want to do. Uh, um, I see another one from Wendy on copper. Uh, copper is very important in a cattle diet. When you run into, if you're sitting in a barn or, or looking at a cow herd and you see cattle with this brown hair, hair coat, um, generally a brown tinge to the hair coat is a copper deficiency. You know, black cattle that look, that kind of look brown down through their flanks and, and down their legs, that's, that tends to be a copper deficiency. Um, copper interacts with all the different minerals, so um, you know, you can have, have a deficiency in copper. You can maybe cause some other issues with, with, um, I think zinc's one that interacts with it. You can run into some foot health issues there with zinc. So really having a balanced mineral program is important as far as keeping overall animal health. Um, but, but having copper in, in, in a cattle diet is, is pretty important. Um, generally most commercial minerals are balanced to where you won't run into to much of a copper deficiency depending on your forage if you, on a cow herd depending on your forage availability but if you know on a, on a finishing cattle um, added copper probably isn't that necessary but um, I would suggest whether if, if no matter what you're finishing on I would suggest making sure there's some kind of a vitamin mineral pack in in your program, whether it's, you know, if you're using salty corn, you still want to make sure there's a vitamin mineral pack in there. If you're using the limiters, any of that intake modifiers, they usually have, you know, a balanced mineral pack as part of that program. So we have one minute left and we'll answer any last questions. But I want to take this opportunity to our opportunity to thank both of our presenters um, for presenting a couple days before Christmas. This was an excellent back and forth discussion between the two of you. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I want to just wish everyone a uh, Merry Christmas and thank you to the participants for uh, tuning in tonight. Uh, and one last question from Jay Franzen. Do you use lick tubs year round? No, um, generally we use lick tubs in the fall when we come into stockpiled forage that after we get a frost, the forage drops in quality. 
Um, so we want to provide some added protein to actually help with the digestibility of that forage. So, you know, once we get a frost, that is when we look at putting out lick tubs and we'll use them or some sort of protein supplementation on through the winter. Um, because uh, a little bit of extra protein will, in, it will in, and actually the salivation action of licking the tub will increase your forage digestibility by as much as 15%, um, according to data from, from a lot of different sources. Um, different comp Pretty much diff every different company now is offering some kind of a tub. Um, and, and from what I figured, that, that increase in digestibility of the forage in the long run will pretty much cover that cost of the tub. Thank you, Dave and everybody. This has been an amazing conversation. I think it's interesting to see everybody's different viewpoints and it's good to see people talking about grain finishing beef again, uh, especially in areas where there isn't as much grass. And sometimes in the winter time, it is important to feed our cattle grain here in Iowa. We've got to realize that it does really affect the animal health and the animal quality of life here in Iowa in the winter time. You know, one thing that that we ran into that, you know, when we first started to do the grass fed beef, we really found that it was tough in the winter. You've got to keep those animals on an elevating plane of nutrition and keep them gaining weight. Um, Cause if you don't, when you finally do get them where you've got good grass, they won't gain. Um, we've starved them through the winter thinking that we were going to do this grass fed the first time of year we did it. We, we tried to starve them through the winter and not, by God, we can't let them have any grain. And, and that first group of calves, when they hit green grass in the su summer, they didn't gain nothing. And, and it was sickening to see. So um, the main thing, trying to make sure you keep them on a, on a good plan of nutrition where they're still gaining at least a pound a day. Um, economically, you can't afford to have them gain less than two, but you got to keep them gaining because if you don't, once they finally hit that point, they won't do it for you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. And I hope that you can apply some of these principles to your cow herd over this winter. Uh, and thanks again to Dave and Shannon and Bo. Happy holidays. Yeah, I wanted to thank Shannon and Bo for taking the time to do this. I feel like I've learned an awful lot. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. We, we've learned a lot from this conversation having as well.